Hey folks, welcome to a special uh, deep dive, uh, designer deep dive. Today we're going to have a chat with Terry Doherty and uh, I had to do a little bit of editing up front so we kind of dump into the conversation sort of uh, part way, but it is the beginning of the interview, what happened, uh, everything sort of preceding it was uh, general rambling about games and our experience at Game On and stuff like that. So this uh, interview took place about a week and a half ago, the first week in Feb, and I have since read the full and uh, basic and advanced rules for this game system, and there, it's obviously a work in progress at the moment. There's some bits and pieces uh, in the formatting that need to be fixed, and a few minor errors, and a couple of sections that are in the wrong area, or aren't meant to be in the in the rules, in the advanced rules in particular. But the basic game rules are pretty clean and pretty tight. Uh, I think it's going to be, uh, if you're a Love of Tie fan, and you've always wanted to sort of you wish that it could jettison its 50 year history and, and sort of be rewritten and refreshed and revived. This could be the rule set for you. If you've always been uh, La Bataille curious, then this could be the rule set for you to uh, have a look at to see if uh, a more, a deeper, more sophisticated, but clean, uh, clean playing and ra fairly rapid playing system is the, is the system for you. So uh, system is called On Battles. And uh, in fact, tonight I will be starting a, a game with Jeff Newell, uh, the host of Game On, along with Pete Gade and, and Ralph Shelton and a few other folks. But uh, the battle for Vermirio, Vermirio, is the first battle we'll be playing. And it's interesting that we get to play this particular battle because I have some experience with the NBS system and I've played the Vermirio battle there. So it'd be nice to be able to compare and contrast it to MBS, which while being a defunct and yet, uh, you know, a dead MMP uh, system for the time being, uh, we'll, we'll get to have a look at that. There's uh, only four pages of charts, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go listen to what Terry has to say about the system. And hopefully my questions uh, elicit some interest for you to uh, follow up on this. Like that system. Yeah, it's a good system. Fiddly. <laughs> it is fiddly. All right, so I'm here with Terry Doherty. What I wanted to do today, to have a conversation with you about your new Napoleonic system and perhaps understand more about how you came to the idea, some of your background, and then let's walk through the design and deep dive concept that we just discussed a few minutes ago and then have a have a chat and see see how things go. Yeah. Okay, so a little bit of background. So I've been uh, been you know, playing war games for since I was a kid, like a lot of guys, yeah. right? Yeah. So I've been uh, basically doing Napoleonics for about thirty years now. So I kinda got into it quite a while ago and uh, then so Labatai I got involved quite involved with Labatai where I think I was like a lot of people where I saw the system and I saw all the beautiful counters and the maps and and uh, got into it, had a little bit of trouble understanding the rules and, you know, understanding how it all worked and but persisted with it and then uh, got involved uh, with Ed Wimble working on uh, Orthez and then also working on cleaning up the uh, the Regs 22, as they were called at that time. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of evolved slowly over a number of years and ended up becoming the Regs 30, which are widely used by a lot of people now. Yes. That's kind of a set of rules that encompasses all the games in the system. And <clears throat> the exclusive rules for all those games have been updated so that and they're available on that labatai.us website that's right. with all those rules that <clears throat> since I stepped away from the system, I passed that over to Nigel Berry, who's a, who's a really knowledgeable guy, really energetic. So he's a good, he's a good fit for that. And I'm pretty, pretty happy with the, the work that he's done on, on keeping that going. And, uh, <clears throat> so then, so after the regs 30, so then Ed Wimble, I was working on, a. Some eighteen thirteen games for Labatai, and then Ed Wimble asked me if if, if I'd like to redo Mos Moscow, the Battle of Moscow game, and so I did that, and that was a pretty good experience. I spent a lot of time reading about uh, the eighteen twelve campaign and all its glory and horror. Yes, yes, so, horrific, <laughs> horrific. Yes, yes, is the word. Yes, for sure. And retreat was, I think, uh, probably probably pretty horrific in the annals of all the bad things that have happened to humanity and the history of the world. And especially, uh, they don't talk about it a lot, but the, the civilians, the Russian civilians really suffered terribly yes. in, the, 
in the RDO. And so when you were reading, what where what were your sources and who did you read? Do you have, have a particular favorite author that you like that you can recall at the moment? Or? So I kind of in the in the in at the end of the, the Moscow special rules there's a there's a bibliography which is fairly extensive. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And that's got uh, that's got some some pretty good sources. So I think one of the best operational coverages is by a guy that actually wrote in the 1860s. He was a uh, a U.S. officer you know, for the uh, the Union. And uh, Theodore A. Ralt Dodge, if I pronounce his middle name correctly. And he wrote quite a few books, but his, his operational history is really good. Um, there's some other ones that are really good for the political. So like a guy named Curtis, who was ambassador to France for a number of years, wrote uh, a book on the campaign. And he was, he was really good for, uh, for the political background. And then uh, probably for uh, the overall campaigns, Zamoyski is a pretty good read because it's a newer, newer author. And then another guy, Alexander Mikabridza, who's a, a professor who grew up in Georgia, you know, formerly formerly Russian Republic, mm-hmm. Soviet Republic, and, and now I think he's at uh, Louisiana State University, and so he's 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 done a number of books on the Russian campaign and translated quite a few works from Russian into English, which is very helpful. Yes, because that's a yes for accessibility for Westerners. That's a big barrier, right. right? And unfortunately, like a lot of the a lot of the Russian scholars just really. Are in their own little kingdom and they aren't really interested in translating their their information for English audiences. But <clears throat> right, and well, and we see that problem in the Eastern Front games, yes, right, where yes, it's all very yeah, exactly. German centric, and then mm-hmm. they get these these tidbits from from the yes. Russian side that we grab onto and right. realize that they have a different version of history. Yes, yeah. yes. surprising, yeah. very different. Yeah, <laughs> so it's always good to get all sides. Yes, to kind of, and then you maybe arrive at the truth, but maybe not. You know, yeah, just a better understanding, yeah. maybe. or at least another version of it. Right, mm-hmm. right. So, okay, so good research, dug into that battle, then tell me a little bit more from there. So then, so also with the with the <coughs> Moscow game, we introduced a new set of rules, which was Marie Louise, Louise, yes, Louise versus yes, the side, yes. which actually became really popular. Yes. I, I really enjoyed playing those at conventions because they mm-hmm. were a lot faster playing and you could get through a lot more turns than you could with the, the full Now, did you work on those rules yourself? Or yeah, did I, you I did, that, I did that? the, the Marie Louise, Louise oh, rules okay. in, entirely. Oh, okay. Wow. All right. I didn't realize that. Okay, that's very cool. Yeah, done right. those. Because they're good. I, I enjoyed reading them, and I have not, but I have not used them in anger. Yeah, yeah it's a lot of, and that's, I guess, probably the, I think the most difficult part I found about Labatai was just that it has such a long history. The system's been around for 50 years now. And it, it means different things to different people. Right. And so you, you'd get people that had played it in the 70s when they were in college or high school. And then, you know, for life reasons, got out of war game and then came back and wanted to play it again. And some of them would, would be upset that there were new rules. <laughs> and some of, them, some of them would be, you know, oh, okay, cool, and play new rules. And right. then, then you got the, the gamers who want... You know, super detail and wanted to go farther and farther. And farther. Yes. And then the, the hyper competitive gamers, where you got guys that they need everything in the rules to be ironclad because they're like every little advantage they can possibly take, right. take advantage right. of. It. So there was some, lawyering their way to victory. Yes, lawyering their way to victory. And uh, there was a, a group in North Carolina that was really, really competitive, but they were good because they really found a lot of things in the rules that need to be. Right. They serve a purpose, rest. don't they? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For yeah, sure. yeah. So. Yeah, we had a, had a lot of fun with playtesting, working through all the possibilities. So oh. then, kind of, so after Moscow was done, you know, I kind of, I kind of wanted to, to keep moving forward. So one of my philosophies is continuous improvement. So I, I strongly believe believe in that. that nothing, nothing is ever perfect. Right. And you can either streamline things or just make things more real, realistic while streamlining at the same time. And just make general improvements, and also maybe add more detail for the the guys that want to do the the ultimate gaming experience and have as much detail as possible in the, the campaign for North Africa guys. <laughs> right, right. Our, our favorite Bernie and uh, lugging the water for the pasta stories. Yes. But so yeah. Uh, but I like detail, but I also like uh, elegance and, mm-hmm. and fast playing. So mm-hmm. consistency, I think, is good. So try not to you know make too many things quirky. You know, so right. if you're retreating, you know, it's always three hexes or something like right. that. Not do these oddball things oh we're in this situation you go two x's in this situation you go three x's what makes it easy to remember yeah it makes it easy to remember all the edge cases and exceptions just build 
built yes. friction in gameplay and gameplay time yes. and all those. Trying to reduce the number of times you have to. <gasps> yeah. Dive into the rules to right. cut for something. Right. Right. Page flip in. So okay. So uh, so you worked on those systems on Mary Louise, and then what was the catalyst for on battles? Then what? You know, because you've got Mary Louise, and it's great, and people like it, and what what happened? So I think for me, the catalyst was uh, after Moscow, the uh, the ME guys had, who had originally developed the system had, had were like those guys that had played it in the seventies, and then gave it up, and they basically sold the uh, the trademark to to Ed Wimble. Mm. and so then they had resurfaced and started publishing their own games again. So then at that point, it, it kind of became you know. The ME guys rules versus the Regs 30 rules and the Marie Louise rules, and it just became kind of chaos. And I wanted to keep kind of moving forward, but there wasn't really a good path to do that. So. And so that's always confused me. With you know, there's, so there's three sets of rules for the same set of counters and maps. Yes. And I would go to a website and I download stuff and I download editions and extracts and bits and pieces and go, okay, cool. And then I go, oh, hang on, this. Is something else over here and that's also love a tie and i it i'm a simple guy i get confused easy yeah. so i, I just I kind of washed my hands over the whole thing and said i'm just gonna let someone teach me how to play this at some point in the future <laughs> so, well that's kind of right. i guess the, the, the realization that i'd come to you that said i mean my i guess i i kind of like this i can't I, I think i went into it with a mis misconception in terms of trying to bring order out of chaos mm -hmm. and uh I was unsuccessful. Right. And on the back of the fact that you really weren't able to change the format of the counters, the way the maps are structured or the scale right. or any of that, you really had to work within those confines, which meant we were dealing with some of the things that generate some friction with that system anyway, with right. constantly flipping counters over and yeah. So yeah, it's basically dozens, dozens of morale checks and all comes that. down to creative, creative differences and yes. And uh, so on battles is born in your so head on battles is born in my head yeah. and you've got this huge wealth not only of game building knowledge and rules building knowledge but as i read the designer notes and i haven't read all of the rules so so i'm not going to get into the super detail on the mm -hmm. rules and, yeah, and yeah. that's probably not what people want to hear anyway no problem. but reading the designer notes i am fascinated as to where you found some of the some of the unique details about skirmishes and cavalry and how cap and how there's I didn't know there were two types of skirmishes, yeah. right? I didn't, there are, and that's probably just really exposing my ignorance of things. But uh, and assault, I've I've heard the stories about assault before, but really it's people don't like pointy things stuck in them. So right. there, there's a lot of running before there's much fighting and right. things of that nature. But there's some really interesting detail just in you know, these four or five pages of designer notes that expose me to uh, the fact that this is going to be a different system than perhaps what other people have played before. Yeah. Right. Yes, yeah. it will be. So, so, so tell me, so what we like to do is, so you, you obviously got this weight of knowledge and weight of experience. And these, and this is not a 10 page rule book and, and you know, it's simple. This is a basic game and an advanced game. And this is meaty detailed, but, but looks like it's playable. Based yeah. on what I'm seeing, based on what I'm seeing at the con here mm -hmm. today, looks like you guys are moving along at a pretty decent clip. So tell us about what you wanted to, and maybe if you need to compare and contrast with Labatai, that's cool because I'm sure there's a lot of people who understand that system. But however you want to, can you just share with us your design idea? Sure. Where did the idea come from, and and how how are we going to get to something awesome, and what's that going to be? Well, a lot of the ideas were ruminating while I was working on Labatai. <laughs> So in terms of like the skirmishers, I have kind of worked that out for Labatai. With this, I was able to streamline it, streamline it further by having new counters. But the, right. the basic idea could be applied to Labatai as well. And same thing. So, so the command rules are where the advanced command rules are a step and above anything else you will see in any other kind of game. And with the exception of maybe something created by historical concepts a long, long time ago, there's a game. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. I guess they have a Morango game where they had some similar ideas. And so the advanced game command rules comes straight out of the regulations of the period on how to how to command a brigade and how to maneuver a brigade mm. in in uh, in close order formations. So it, it pretty much follows exactly what's spelled out. That's interesting. And that's always been a big hole with Labatai. Uh, it's been system. a big hole in a lot of games because yeah. basically in, in Labatai and most battalion scale games, the, 
the battalions can move any way they want as long as they stay within command radius. Right. And it's kind of like you're kind of telegraphing how they should move. And so they can crisscross or swing around things without any kind of problem at all. Right. In reality, they had to maintain distances to each other and had to kind of watch what they were doing. And so the, the basic command structure they used was that for guys formed in a line of battle of multiple battalions, they'd have the brigade commander would go sit with the battalion commander and that would become what they would call the directing battalion. Yes. And so their colors would literally advance out in front of the line a ways so that everybody else down the line could see it. New, new way to go, who to follow up, basically. Yeah, and right. so then when that those guys started moving forward, the rest of them followed. If those guys formed square, the rest would form square. And then if they wanted to wheel, the commander would tell the adjutant where to go and wave him left to right with his sword, and then they'd you know wheel onto that new line. And, and so the advanced command rules have all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And in the, in the basic rules, we still have the simple command range. And so I guess uh, probably one of the philosophies also is is uh, to try and keep the core basic rules as quick playing as possible while pl- providing enough Napoleonic flavor and also make them stable so that they're not changing all the time. Because mm-hmm. a lot of people have, a, and that was a little bit of trouble with La Bataille too, was uh, a lot of people didn't want to change the rules, you know, and I can understand that because that's, uh, you know, you want to... Uh, you want to learn the system and get into it. And you don't want to necessarily have to relearn the rules every year when somebody tinkers with it. And so that's kind of the goal for the basic game is to try and create that stability. And then the advanced rules we will allow to continue to evolve and uh, grow in terms of complexity. And the other philosophy with the advanced rules is if you want the advanced artillery, but you don't want the rest of it, go ahead. Right. Or if you want the advanced formations, but not the artillery, go ahead. Because the advanced, there's a lot of detail in the artillery that adds, adds to playtime. Yes, I, I saw, I, I did, I, for one of the first things I checked for was ricochets. Ricochets, uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. which we call it duck and drake. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, which is kind of what it was called yeah. way back, way back when. Right, right. And uh, so, and. So you can do that, which is cool. Yeah. You, and, and can I bolt on the command rules, the advanced command rules, and play that with the basic? Yes, you could. Yeah. Yes, you could. Fantastic. Yeah. Because right. I think that's a critical part of any Napoleonic system is, is command is so important mm-hmm. to the game. Otherwise, you're just running amok doing your thing, right? Yeah, it's going to take a – it'll take a little bit, I think, of getting used to for people and a little bit of learning So, because it's it's different than what people have experienced before. And so it'll take probably take a little head scratching mm-hmm. and playing it a few mm-hmm. times and mm-hmm. saying, oh, okay. And once you, once you figure it out, it's fairly straightforward. Right. But, uh, but it's a little different. And you also changed the fire combat uh, yes, so, as well. So I got rid of all the complicated calculations with La Bataille. <laughs> so you've got a simple fire system with the values printed on the counters. And so you're just looking at the counter. You don't have to flip it over or anything. You don't have to calculate any math at all to, mm-hmm. to do the fire strength. And then everything is basically column shifts for modifiers. You right. Plus one for column, minus one for skirmishers. And uh, that that kind of thing. I, I was cheering when I saw that because I, I, I found the uh, just it, was, it became math heavy mm-hmm. and you know a lot of counter flipping right. just to get to work out for a yes, shot exactly and, and shot extreme range shots really didn't make any sense given the ranges we were dealing yeah. with anyway for most of the you know all the way through right eighteen fifteen right so right. Yeah. yeah so kind of a, I did a pretty bit uh, quite a bit of research on the artillery. So I did actually went through for for every gun I could find I for its for its length of bore and caliber I calculated the ballistics for it to figure out the ranges so like uh, canister range is point blank so the can the, the gun fired at zero degrees elevation where it's going to hit the ground first first graze then medium range effective range is uh, where the gun at one degree elevation where where first graze yes. and then first yes. graze at two degrees elevation for long range. And, and then I limited the maximum range of artillery to uh, to a thousand meters because right. this line of sight right. at a thousand meters you're looking at something that's like this yeah. big yeah. and yeah. you can hardly see it and it's smoke and let alone firing for effect right yeah, I mean, you know, and, and, and with no ability to have the same shot to yeah. land in the same place twice so right. even though some of the guns could go further if they elevated a little farther the chances of hitting something is and I it's love the ra- I love the rationale and the design notes about that to yeah. give you some and, and and it's well justified. It's not just well, that's the way it is. Right? You've got some factual basis behind it and done a lot of homework yeah. and rationalize things down to realistic results based on actual usage versus just 
is a gun and a bore and it could fire this far. Right, right. 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 So, yeah, so yeah, and there's like doctrinal things too, like the British didn't fire a canister past a couple hundred yards. Yeah. That was just the way they did it. Yeah. Even though their guns could shoot at that, yeah. shoot it further, they just didn't do that as a matter of course. <laughs> Um, so that's reflected in the in the charts for the artillery, and also different types of canister by nationality that you you looked at as well. You looked yes, at the effectiveness yeah. of those, which yeah, I, okay. I didn't realize that we. I always thought canister was canister. So uh, yeah, there's actually two types of canister. Well, yeah, two two basic types, which is you know, heavy and light, and then yes. varieties of flavors of heavy and light, and and basically you know the light. It's all about the friction of the bullet in the air. The lighter the ball, the more wind friction takes right. into account it doesn't go as far my gosh okay right right so, yeah, that's yeah. All, that's all, all that comes down to and uh so yeah and then you got howitzer fire and round shot and different different types and so i took like the, the howitzer scatter diagram i got from sharn horse artillery tables which he had put together and actually had the uh, the probability of error for you know lateral lateral error for the sides or longitudinal error and of course there's more error longitudinally along the axis mm -hmm. of fire mm -hmm. and so that's where the little artillery uh, the, the scatter diagram is, is that funny shape that it is that's interesting yeah yeah and just for uh, so what i might do actually for uh, the, the listeners of this is i might take a couple of pictures after we okay finish. i mean i can send these to you yeah you maybe want. send them to me it'd be great I'll, I'll include that in the video in the background so you have to give me your email address like. perfect we'll take care of that yeah uh so uh let's see so weapon systems and command and then what about and the counters you really decided that it was easy it was going to be easier and more effective just to have counter face and then nothing on the rear <laughs> And all the information we need is on the front, is correct? Yes, yeah. that's correct. Yeah. And in, in a readable font, I believe, as well. Yeah, so after playing today, we're probably going to even simplify that a little further and combine, like, or just maybe, like, a, take a column on the fire table and call it the, the, the column for guys firing in column. Because most of those values calculate out the same. I actually have some game designers' notes, which I can share with you, because I kind of, as I was going through and designing the first games, I kind of wanted to write all that down so that I could maintain some level of consistency as yes. I go from game to game and not think, scratch my head and say, well, what did I do in that case? <laughs> and try and refigure right. that out. Right. So, so I can share those with you. And uh, so that kind of, that shows how I came up with the fire values and the combat value modifiers and based on some initial, some, you know, subjective reasoning of what you think the unit's morale is. And so that's, you know, that's all, that's all where the subjectivity comes into the design is, you know, how good do you think these guys really were at this particular point in time? Interesting. Okay. That's very cool. Now, and with the, with the maps, I, I noticed the, uh, so it's all playtest art that you've got there. Do you have a artist lined up? Do you have a different feel for how you want the art to look? Because it looks simplified, but I don't know if that's your playtest art or whether you're going to try and evoke period periodicity uh on the map so i have, have kind of different ideas about that so i'm not sure you know i kind of the it's nice to have the lots of pretty on the map but yeah if it's not important for play is it, is it really necessary right <laughs> so that's kind of the dilemma of, of right. going, going for pretty versus right. clarity have, have you seen the pratson edition uh maps i think that system's called the return of the emperor or something like that it's called the empress yeah, something there I forget what it's called now. Lower tour. Yeah, I've seen it, but I have to go back and look at it too. Yeah, Remember, I very, looked at it for quite pretty, a while. pretty basic. Uh, but it does, but it feels, it, it has an evocative feel a bit for it, even though there's no hex numbers and stuff, mm -hmm. stuff like that. It make, makes it hard to set up, but you tend to get generalized set up with it. I really like those maps. And you've seen the Hexasim? Yeah. yeah, they're quite attractive. But, yeah, sorry, so, bit, yeah, a lot bit, of it. Yeah, just so much comes down to preference. Yeah, so I hear different things from different people. Yeah, whether isometric view versus top-down view. Right, and, right. Uh, you know whether they like the the full hex or just the the, the little points on the corners of the hexes. Right, that right. We put on this map. And, right. Do you like? Uh, will you uh, have what? Uh, what size will the counters be? So the counters will be five eighths inch. So. So we'll keep, we'll keep that yeah. five inch count. So these will be larger games then, or will you start with smaller battles? So I have four four games so far. So my goal when I first started this about five years ago, I had decided that I would do at least four games and put those out there for play testing, 
before we go into publishing because I want to really have the basic rules ironed out like mm-hmm. we talked about it mm-hmm. and make them stable and not have to go back and tweak right. again and again and again. <laughs> so uh, so we got the four games out now. So we have Rolos, uh, which is a pretty small game that's basically a couple of divisions fighting each other <laughs> and then uh, maybe like two divisions on the British side and one division on the French side. And then Vimiero, which is a little bit larger, but right. yeah. oh, cool. 15,000 guys on each side. That's an interesting little battle, too. Yeah, it is yeah. an interesting little battle. And that's a really quick playing one. And even the Rolosa one is pretty quick playing. So you can play Vimiero in one sitting easy because it's only like six or seven turns. Yep, yep. And, uh, and it's one map. Not it, well, Yeah, I think it's one full size map, 20, 22 by 34. And then uh, we have Fuentes Dionoro, which is a bigger game. It's got four maps. And uh, about fifty thousand guys on a side, so not still not huge by Central European standards. Yes. And then Salamanca, which has three maps and about sixty thousand guys on the side. And is the what was the rationale uh, looking at uh, Peninsula campaign first? Uh, yeah. so the main rationale for the Peninsula campaign is that it's, it's really popular. Really? Yeah. Interesting. So a lot of people really like the Peninsula okay. campaign. Okay. I just I just found some of those battles uh, a challenge to get excited about. I like Vimiro because it, it's a small, quick mm-hmm. battle and it has some there's some quirkiness to it anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, with the command change and all that sort of fun stuff. But uh, okay, so that's, that's fascinating. Do you have intentions to uh, look at you know Jenna and? Uh, Austerlitz yeah, and for sure, yeah. Yilau and So kind of my next area that I'm going to do several battles in. So kind of one thing I do also is kind of I look at a campaign and mm-hmm. if there's a bunch of battles in there, I'll kind of do the designs all at once for right. all of them. Because right. you've kind of got all the research there and it's easier to go battle to battle to battle. In. So you do the chunks, 1806, 1809 yeah. and then the, pop, pop so the 1815 campaign. Next time moving to Italy, 1795 to oh, 97. Sweet. Oh, sweet. Okay. So there's a whole right. slew of battles there. And those are going to be really nice battles because they're they're not going to be huge. It'll be like one or two maps, and you can uh, play those probably pretty quickly. That's probably smart, I think, to start with smaller battles, get people engaged with the system, it makes it easier for them to to, yeah. to to have a taste without having to make a massive investment. Are you going to buy? Is it will be are the first four individual boxed games? One, at one each, or are you bundling together, or how are you planning well, like, on getting Rol- those out Rolison to the public? and could probably be bundled together because they're going to be they they would they would share a lot of counters at least for the British side, right? And then so so you could do Rolison and Vimiero on like one counter sheet together, and then two maps, right? And then the Rolison map is really like a seven. I think it's a seventeen by twenty two map. I, I blew it up just because I could print it out big, but right. so it's got like one and a half inch hexes or something ridiculous. Right, right, right. So, cool. <laughs> But uh, but for a normal printing, it'd be on like a seventeen by twenty-two. Okay, and so when when do you think that you'll be ready to move the to a either to a publisher or will you publish yourself? What's the plan? So publishers, I want to I want to make sure I get somebody that's going to do good artwork. I right. don't want to just have a vanilla because I think one of the one of the big appeals of La Bataille has always been the beauty of it. Yes. And so I kind of want to continue that beautiful, beautiful counters, beautiful maps. Like Rick's maps, right? Yeah. yeah. And make them and, you know, get that kind of, a, you know, sexiness and allure of, of having something that's visually appealing. Yes. There's a wonderful Spanish and I think maybe even Portuguese and there's a Russian chap as well. Uh, Ilya, I think his name is. They do some really nice maps now for some of the smaller uh, niche publishers, uh, Holland Spiel and mm-hmm. uh, some guys like that. So I'm, I'm sure you you know all the guys you, that you probably want to work with, but uh, I'll be curious to see what the final artwork looks like. So you'll have to get, so you need to find yourself a publisher, agree your terms and yeah. all that sort of good stuff, and then get into the, the artwork side of things. Yeah, so I'm hoping, uh, hoping it, well, we'll see how fast the playtest goes, goes. I mean, that's always kind of unknown is how long playtesting is going to take and, right. and make sure you've got everything covered. Because like I said, I, I want the basic game to be pretty stable. Right. And and so, so do you feel like that's this year you'll finish up with the playtesting on the basic system across the four, the four different battles, or will it take a, a year or more? So I'm hoping to get that done mostly this year. Okay. Yeah. We'll start shopping for a publisher next year. 
and see where that kind of goes. Very cool. So for all the publishers who listen, <laughs> it's your opportunity. Now, would you ever consider doing it yourself and, and going through a Kickstarter exercise or anything like that? Well, if we can't, uh, if I can't find somebody that is willing to kind of give me the terms I want in terms right. of that, then, right. then I would consider that. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a lot of work, right? It's when you do self-publishing. It's, yes. And then uh, the whole handling the sales aspect of it, and, you know, that's that's a, that's a the pretty, pretty big burden, and, burden yeah, of work, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. And, not something to be taken lightly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's a. It is a really big job. I think people underestimate what it takes to get a game out. Right? Yes. Yeah, I think so. It's all well and good to say I'm going to do a Kickstarter and you get a hundred thousand dollars in, but now you've got to make sure that production's done right and the art's done right, and yes, then yeah. you're going to get the shipping organized and the shrink wrapping and the the compilation, the yes. whole the whole eyes, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But you seem like a detailed guy. Are you? What's your profession? So I am an electrical engineer. So okay. My, my main job is integrated circuit design. Okay. Which is you know designing computer chips. So, so it's, all, it's all detail work. Yes. You're, 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 yeah. So yeah, it's sim- similar in that regard in terms of lots of paying attention to detail. Yes. Trying to get things right. Excellent. Okay. So now, uh, in terms of gameplay, so can you can you give us a little flavor for uh, what what does it take to actually execute a Small assault or a round of combat in a uh, in, in, in on battles versus other Napoleonic systems. So I think there's a lot of common elements. So kind of uh, I'd done a lot of research a long time ago about uh, various attack methods, and so I had actually worked a little bit with Brent Osworthy on that, and he had sent me some material, and uh, I'd use a lot of that for a basis in terms of of. Uh, of combats, and so in my in my view, it's kind of a lot like chicken in terms of you've got these muskets which are really slow to load, so holding that fire until the best possible moment mm-hmm. of being able to inflict the most damage on the enemy is super important. And the reason that's super important is because morale is the most important thing, but the but the way to gain morale superiority over the other side is to inflict damage on them through firepower, and that's a big change from you know the Pike era where it's uh, firepower starting to evolve, but still, still shock action is yes. is important. Yes, and so I mean shock action here is still important, but it's it's not a, it's not clash of steel. It's mo- it's mostly firepower, and then the pointy things come at you and you run away. Right. Unless it's cavalry, and then the cavalry, of course, is all sword action, and yes. for the most part. So then, it, so then, who fires first is all about that game of chicken, and then in the sequence of play, we kind of. It kind of goes through a few steps just because of uh, simplifying how things happen in, in the, the order of events. And then also generally giving the benefit to the defender, because as, as Claus would have said, you know, de- defense is the stronger form of combat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you give them a little benefit. So the attackers check morale first, defenders check morale second, defenders fire first, and attackers fire second. <clears throat> so the results of that first morale check determine whether or not they're going to go in or whether they're going to stand, but it also determines how effective their fire is. So if you pass your morale check, you get some fire benefit, which helps you then inflict more casualties on the enemy and then gain that more moral superiority. Right. And it's not simultaneous, right? Resolution, right? The defender right, it's not will sim- simultaneous, right. yeah. And that's, you know, the nod to the defender is where the defender gets to go first. Yes. And what what about cavalry charges? How How do you handle those? Because that's a that's a big part of the yeah cal- cavalry is fairly era. well I've, yeah, I've tried to simplify cavalry quite a bit so it can get messy <laughs> it can get very messy counter charges yes so oh. we still have those things charges and counter charges we've kind of uh, simplified some of the reactions and and uh, other kind of events that can happen during the process and just kind of make that a little bit uh, easier to t- kind of go through and that's probably that'll be you know one of the areas that requires a lot of play testing because that's that's one of the areas where there's just so much variability in terms of what can happen because like you say it's just charges and counter charges and all these things that could potentially go on and trying to keep the number of possibilities right simple. and right. that's part of that a lot of that is part of careful sequence of play design and careful counter design to help with a lot of that kind of stuff so <laughs> i spent a lot of time working on the counter so gone through like four different versions of counters 
and uh, to come up what, what, with what we currently have. And then there'll be probably another iteration that simplifies the counters further. Okay. And also, there's some little symbols on there to give you cues to what the unit's capabilities are. <laughs> right now, those are probably a little too small, so we'll make those bigger by removing some of the numbers from the counters and right. making the symbols bigger, yeah, that's more color. It's interesting that you're going to use some symbol symbology because I've noticed, uh, uh, which I think is a good thing, I've noticed a movement towards using... And people get a little frustrated sometimes, but using color and symbols or combinations thereof, either on the numerals for the the uh, the units, but you know, triangles or stars or a sword or whatever it may be, to uh, passively give you information yeah. without having to pick up a chart and look at yes, it and cross reference yeah. it to, oh, infantry can do these four things, right? It's all on the counter. And yeah. I think that is smarter and it makes play faster as yes. well which is great so you would be trying to think i think you would be among the first of napoleonic designs to really do much with that other than the nato symbols or the cat or the you know the the classic uh yeah cavalry guys but, right right uh, and that's one difference with this game is uh <laughs> so labatai you had the, the strength point values and you'd knock one off every time they got hit with them yes fire attack and then uh, in this game we still have strength points for stacking and uh, how, how much to fire out of the hex but we also have uh, but we've switched away to steps so now you've got a unit so typical units have like two steps and the system is also more morale driven than Labatai where Labatai was more casualty driven where you wouldn't really see a degradation in morale until they were like 50% right mm-hmm. so this you'll see Step losses are much more rare, so there's there's a lot more morale checks, but the penalties of morale checks are more severe than than a lot of the time. <clears throat> but then the step losses do that same thing where the guard units can have many steps, and the you know militia has one step, right? Right. And so the, and then also when you flip the counters over, you can change their values on the counters, right? So they can yes. <laughs> degrade their combat capability, yeah, you know, not, not linearly. Yes. Uh, yes. Like with lot of the where everything's linear. Yes. Extremely linear. Extremely linear. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it gives you a lot more variability. And again, that's all about you know careful, careful counter design. And, mm. You know, learning learning all the game design techniques we've learned over the last 30, 40 years, and fifty years. And that's awesome. In, awesome. Incorporate all that. Make a <clears throat> make a simpler system that's more natural to play. And, Keep referring back to Love of Tide, but in terms of because it's kind of a reference system for the, the mature, the mature and complex. The right. grandfather it is the grandfather. From a reference standpoint, would you say how much, what percentage faster would a turn be of an equivalent size game with two games side by side? So, given well, given the so I've mostly so so far the play testing has mostly involved smaller games, and those you can play pretty quickly because there's not a lot of counters. And I don't think there's a good comparison with Labatai for those because it, there's not a lot of small games. They tend to larger, yeah. But uh, for the Fuentes Dionoro game, which we're playing. Is a, is a good size battle. And so I would say it's playing about three times faster, even than like the ML rules, which for me, I played the ML rules a lot at conventions because mm-hmm. they are faster mm-hmm. playing. So it would still take you a long time to get through a full turn. So it's, it's definitely definitely a lot faster playing. So I, I would say, yeah, it's about three times faster. So we're, we're already through, played like 20 turns or so. Which in Labatai would pretty much consume the, the whole three day game weekend easy. Right, right. And what about setup and breakdown? That's important too. That's a that's always a bugbear with the Polyonic games because there's so many formations and formation colors and names and things. How are you planning on dealing with that side of the So we have the com- thing? command displays that are similar to Labatai where you got all the counters laid out so you can kind of see that. And that puts also puts their command ranges right on there. Which <laughs> that'll probably be a change we'll make too is we'll put the command radius right on the leader counter. Mm-hmm. And so you can just look at the counter to see what their their range is rather than going back to the charts. And then, uh, but then there's basically a setup hex, and you just say within so many hexes of this. And there's the, he- the hexes are numbered. So we use kind of the gamer's style of numbering where we're, we're numbering, numbering every fifth row. Right. Which that's more for aesthetics, but some, oh, some people don't like that. Oh, no, I love that. That's great. So some, yeah. some people really, really hate that. They like to have every hex number because it, it does take a little bit longer to find something. Uh, you know. So it's 
So a lot of that. There's only four spaces in between there. Yeah, it's it's going to be okay. Yeah, you'll find it. Yeah. Especially once you're familiar with the map. So you'll yeah, find sure, it. of course. Yeah. So I'll probably stick with that. Yeah. But uh, so that's the basic setup. So we don't don't micromanage it too much and try and give you the historic setups. And then also for the bigger games, I have a lot of scenarios. So there's like six or seven scenarios in, in each of the bigger games to give people that have limited space a little more options to set right. those up. Right. And uh, I noticed there's uh, only four pages of charts, yes, including so, terrain, right? So one of the things that after doing a lot of conventions with Labatai is just <clears throat> the shuffling through all the pages of charts really slows things down. Mm-hmm. And so one of my goals was to just have four pages so you can put it on an 11 by 17 card and yep. that's all you've got. <laughs> so that in some cases, the advanced artillery rules kind of spill over too long. So like for Salamanca, the advanced artillery table gets pushed onto another page. But for the guys that want to play the advanced stuff, that's okay to have yeah, additional yeah. charts. But, yeah, sure, sure. But the basic stuff will be the four, four, chart, four pages of charts. And my other philosophy with that is I don't like games where they have a series rule book and then somebody comes out with a new game and they rewrite the series rules and the exclusive rules. So then I have to reread another 20 pages of rules. So we're trying to avoid that. And, you know, woods are woods, right? So you don't have to have a different woods rule for this game and a wood, different woods rule for this other game. So those things will go on the core rules. And, and mm. that is one area where we simplified the terrain a lot also is just there's four, four terrain types and then, well, I guess five if you count hexide obstacles. So right. then it fits into one of those four categories and those four categories have certain effects on the units in combat. So you don't have to create a new set of rules. You just have to say this type of train is you know, medium density or high density train or, or light density or just clear. And so then it all kind of fits in that. And, and the rules don't change. You just have right. a new terrain type, which goes on the train effects chart and tells you what type it is, movement costs and combat value modifiers and, Right, so using, de- using density as the defining element versus uh, right. light woods, medium woods, and heavy woods, right. or whatever the case may be, right. like yeah. hedgerows and things like that. Yeah, so if you have open, relatively open woods, you can call it light density terrain. Right. And it's, you know, maybe lower movement cost and all that stuff. Right. That's just another good simplification. I like that. Uh, let's see, what else? I had another question I wanted to ask you about, not counters. Oh, uh, scenario-specific rules. Uh, so will you be dry? So will, you mentioned that you're going to keep uh, a consolidated rule book, but what about the scenario specifics? So there's obviously a lot of nuance and a lot of funky things that happen in, in these battles. You'll be run, I'm assuming you'll have scenario-specific rule book or scenario-specific yes, rules. A, there's a scenario-specific rule book, which right now they're – and that's kind of one of my goals also is to try and keep keep the number of new rules in the specific rule book to a minimum you know really just stuff that is unique to the battle yes and maybe something about command you know if there's some particular unique command situation or some unique thing you know some kind of river crossing or something something that's unusual mm-hmm. then those will be put in there things that are more standard will go in the regular rules and, and be there and just be be consistent to try and try and keep the size of that special rule book down to a minimum very cool okay so let's just... and then it's all just mostly the setup information which of course gets extensive for the bigger battles yeah. listing all the units and okay putting in the historical commentary right yeah so i guess so that that'll obviously be a, another another interesting element because you can write a, I, you gotta stop yourself there don't you because you could probably write a book sometimes yeah <laughs> i like to so i've I like to actually take a actual, you know, first-hand participant accounts or something. Also, sometimes and use those for the uh, for the description of the battle. So, mm-hmm. especially if it's in a French or German, take the time to translate it and put that in there because that sometimes gives a perspective that oh, nice. English audiences are not really, oh, yeah, very cool. Really okay. uh, used to seeing. Yeah, very cool. That's interesting. That's a great idea. And uh, I guess you, you will probably look for a box art. Uh, assistance as well, so you'd yeah. be looking. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not really. I'm really not a very good artist, so I'm probably not the best person to do that kind of stuff. Either. Right, right. 
Because I'm like stick figure horses. I'm an, I'm yeah. an engineer. Charts, charts are good. Yeah, charts are good. That's great. That's great. Well, cool. Well, was there anything else that you wanted to share about the system that you think that I haven't uh, touched on or asked about? You no. Know, so the only thing I guess I would say is the, the advanced rules. The advanced rule, most of the stuff in the advanced rules goes well way beyond anything you'll see in in the the regs thirty from Labatai. So it's there's a lot more stuff in there than what's there, but it's still much much simpler than what's in the regs thirty, even the the advanced rules. So right. people that are, people that are into that should check it out. Very and I know there's there's a lot of guys that are really into the detail. <laughs> those a lot of the guys I can correspond with, I got to kind of hold them back. Right. Say, yeah, no, no, we got that's too much. We got to keep it past playing and right yeah and uh, i guess we probably should well, i probably should have uh, uh mentioned this or asked this at the very, very beginning hex scale oh so hex scale is 125 meters per hex wow okay so that kind of so labatai labatai is a variable scale so it's like yes. 80 85 to 125 yards depending on the game and uh so so we'll try and stick with the 125 i think that's it that's a good number for the napoleonic period yeah and so then in terms of scale units, it's similar to Labatai. So 100 infantry per strength point, uh, 50 cavalry, and two guns. And the reason those numbers are, are like that is because they, they all occupy roughly the same frontage. So that was that was one thing I simplified from Labatai, too, is the, the stacking rules. You know, there's no reason to have three pages of stacking rules. <laughs> so... <laughs> just those kinds of things yeah just yeah. A, lot, a lot of simple things that's excellent okay and time 30 minute 20, 20 minute 20, 20 minutes minute, per turn 20 minutes yep yep that's oh, and i guess uh probably should play a little bit about the basic command rules the basic command rules are are much simpler so they're basically command range and and the sequence of play is an i go you go sequence and kind of the the reason for that was I wanted to keep the basic command rules as simple as possible, and then also doing the simplified sequence of play also resolves some some just rules idiosyncrasies by things happening in certain orders with chip holes and other kinds of things. And uh, but there is there is a a reserve segment so where you get to do some stuff as the player that goes first, and then the guy that has guys that he puts in reserve can then react to that. So if he sees you bringing up some cavalry cavalry that's ready to charge and he could potentially have some guns that are limbered up and then move them in and unlimber them in front of you and start mm. blasting away mm -hmm. so it, it so it gives a gives a some uncertainty to, to what the attacker is actually going to face when they when they're ready to go in and then there's a commander initiative so you roll two dice and see who goes first and then you get to, you get to decide whether you want to go first or the other guy goes first and so you can kind of set yourself up up for a double turn if you right. can carefully sequence that. You but, can get the back to back if it works out. Yes, right? yeah, and that can be uh, one of those things where you see those kind of lopsided victories where everything goes one guy's way and nothing goes the other guy's way. And uh, die rolls mitigated by command ratings, I assume, or, or yes, is it yeah, yeah, command, yeah, right, yeah. command modifiers? Yeah, and we'll. Uh, so one thing was so we mentioned very very beginning we mentioned. Uh, skirmishes but we really didn't talk about mm, right. some of the differences so that might be worth touching on as well i think right so historically so if you go back to like a, probably around the seven years war when they basically started using skirmishers in in uh in a lot in a lot and those basically they hired auxiliaries and they'd send some guy and give him give him a big pocket big pile of money and say go raise a thousand guys as a free corps and then they would become their skirmishers and they would kind of do all the little skirmishing on campaign that you don't really see in a battle. But then, as, and then on the battlefield, they would basically just kind of occupy some position. And those skirmishers would basically, but what they would be called skirmishers on Deva and Dad or skirmishers on Grand, Grand Bond bands or something like that, where they would basically all be in skirmish order and have very little formation to them at all. In the other cases where you have skirmishers that are acting closely in concert with the parent battalion, and that's called skirmishers on Tirayar, which was also sort of had, I guess, had probably become more prominent during the around the American War of Independence. So then you see, and there's quite a few writers that you can go back to and look and see what they they wrote, and they describe all this stuff. <laughs> so this guy who was a uh, on, in the, on the British side of the American Revolution, a guy named Von Ewell, which he actually fought in the Seven Years' War also. And so he's a good source to go to to write all that down stuff, all that stuff down. And then there's like 
Rogers Rangers, Rogers Rules for Rangers he had. So if you'd seen like a, the AMC series Turn on TV, so yes. Rod, Rogers shows up in that. Oh, okay. Colonel Rogers. So. Oh, yeah, okay. So he's kind of a bad guy. And then also the guy that plays Simcoe, Lieutenant Colonel Simcoe, wrote some some uh, some uh, some uh, works on skirmishing. So he, he, he later becomes governor of Canada and for quite a number of years, Lieutenant Colonel Simcoe, which at that time in, in, the, in the show, AM's turn, he was just a captain or something. Was he a captain? Yeah, I think he was a captain, Captain Simcoe. That sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting to see that in the TV series. Yeah. Know yeah. a little bit of the background. Yeah. But uh, so you kind of you kind of go back and so kind of the you know I talked to Dave Powell who does the Civil War series a lot so I had a conversation with him one time and he says I'm always looking back to the Napoleonic period to kind of see how it evolved into the what happened during the Civil War and so I said well I'm doing the same thing I'm always looking back to the American War of Independence and the Seven Years War to kind of see how it evolved into the Napoleonic period so <laughs> there's a lot of continuity as, mm-hmm. and how things you know just sort of evolved with the you know improving knowledge about tactics and just slightly improving weaponry right it's just getting a little bit better as it goes along right artillery is a little more powerful muskets can shoot a little further and just that general advance of you know firepower based on the technology right those that technological changes were fairly incremental like, yes. through that whole period of like 70 probably mm-hmm. 80 years yeah. or so and then then come the, the American Civil War, and mm-hmm. the, the tactics really didn't change very much. But the uh, well, they were forced to change because of the right. the leap in lethality of the yeah of the, the rifle, right? Right. So. And so that's going back to scale. That's one reason I picked 125 meters is because I think that was probably more an appropriate range for the Napoleonic Wars. I think probably there was a lot more long range fire that was kind of ineffectual. But was still taking place because you'd see, if you look at the ammunition reports, they're they're shooting off a million rounds per battle, and wow. <laughs> causing, you know, five thousand casualties. Right. So, it's a very <laughs> large volume of fire compared to the Seven Years' War, where yes. where there's much less firing and still fairly fairly large casualties. Yeah, interesting. Actually, when you think about that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then like artillery is similar. You know, they'll fire. Tens of thousands of rounds of artillery can cause some some amount of of casualties. So you can kind of okay. And what about what, what about uh, so coming back to the skirmishes? Uh, so so with your you didn't you end up with are there two modes of skirmisher in the game? Or yeah, there's you... two modes two modes of skirmishers, and not all units are capable of using both modes. So most units are only capable of using one mode, which mm-hmm. is the skirmishers acting in concert with the battalion. Right. And so that improves that improves your defensive capability, and also lets you fire it two hexes out because you're kind of envisioning the skirmish line in front of your parent unit, and they're shooting into the adjacent hexes further. So, right, so, so that skirmishing Jaeger. takes place at a little bit longer range. Right, kind of the Jaeger style uh, yeah. units, right? And then there's where they're breaking down entirely into skirmish order, and that and that becomes a, a little bit of a potential command and control problem because you've got once you've got all those guys spread out it's hard to get them back and so basically you're relying on bugle calls which in in terms of a battle can be very difficult to hear right the artillery going off and general chaos and noise you can only see what's right in front of you the whole soda straw view of the battle Mm. so it's very very that becomes command and control so you've got to pass a, a morale check in order to put those guys in command once they're once they're out there in full skirmish order and then they're more vulnerable to cavalry, so there's some, you know, negative modifiers. And same thing when you throw out your skirmishers in front of the battalion; it kind of diminishes the view that the battalion commander can see because now he's got this line of guys out there shooting, creating smoke, and so they they then become a little bit more vulnerable to cavalry. It, it makes them less vulnerable to infantry, infantry and artillery, but more vulnerable to cavalry. So those, that kind of dynamic is reflected in the rules. All right. Charge into the smoke, right? Yep, charge into the smoke. <laughs> okay. Well, good. Come out of nowhere. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Those are those most devastating charges in history is when all of a sudden there's cavalry they didn't know was there and they just break and run. And save it or piked is the case. Or, or, mm-hmm. or, or, or. Lanced. <laughs> Lanced is what the word I was looking for. Yeah. Speared. Yes. Well, good. Any, so anything else? 
I think that's about it. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, that's probably, I could probably talk about this for hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've really, really enjoyed doing the design and continue enjoying doing the research on the games. Right, well, I can just tell from your, you know, the, your commentary and your, the enthusiasm here, the energy, no one can see the energy, but there's lots of energy about it. And the guys that you're playing with seem to be having a great time too. So I hope it goes really well. I hope we get to have a chance to play something at the end of next year or whatever the case might yeah. be. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah, I'm guessing if we, if we do play testing this year, then it would probably be 20, 2021 before we actually right. see a game published, right. depending on how long it takes to get through that pipeline. Right? Yeah. yeah, wonderful. All right, well, cool. Well, it's good fun. I hope things go well for you. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Right.